You may have seen him on Animal Planet or BBC or Discovery, and he was actually even on some of the shows from my youth. But today, he's right here on Behind the Shot. Jonathan Scott. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. As always, I'm Steve Brazel, your host, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots, from conception to completion, all the stories and challenges that happen in between. And boy, today have I got a guest for you. I am so excited about this one. I'll bring him on in just a second. First of all, I do want to remind you about the new class that I've got coming up in April of 2021. It's with Princeton Photo Workshops at PrincetonPhotoWorkshop.com. It's the challenges of low-light action photography. It's going to be three nights, three consecutive weeks, about an hour and a half each particular night. And uh, I hope you join me. Again, if you go to PrincetonPhotoWorkshop.com, you can find out all the information there. And as well with this show, you can find out all the show notes about my guest today or for any individual episode by going to BehindTheShot.tv, find the episode you're interested in. And for example, with today's guest, I've written a small bit about both he and his wife, and I've got a small gallery of their work. And all the links that we're going to talk about today are going to be available in the blog post as well. Again, that's BehindTheShot.tv, which... Brings me to my guest, Mr. Jonathan Scott of the Big Cat People. How are you? Absolutely. I, I feel like I'm about to take off into space. Now, it's darkness here in Nairobi, Kenya, where we live. But uh, it, it's just such a pleasure to be on your show. And uh, yeah, well, let's talk about that back in your youth days. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's, let's, let's start here. I found out about Jonathan, I've known about Jonathan for a while, but I got introduced to Jonathan by email from my buddy Rick Salmon, a mutual friend of ours, who said, you got you need to have the big cat people on your show. And we started setting this up a while ago, and we finally, we, uh, after probably over a year, we, we're finally here, and I'm so excited because what you do is special on many different levels, okay? Yes, there's the photography level, right? What you capture, I think, is super important important and also amazing from a pure photography point of view. Then there's the television side of you. We'll get into that. And then there's the stuff that you and Angela do as far as, as conservation and preservation and, and that type of a thing. So, and, and by the way, picture behind you of you and Angela. So at least Angela's on the show. That's exactly. Good. Hi, Angela. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about you for a little bit. First of all, yep. let's do the TV host stuff. I mentioned BBC. I mentioned Animal Planet. I mentioned Discovery. But in the green room, you mentioned a TV show. Tell me about that one. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins, Jim Fowler. And uh, in the 19, it, it was the longest running, continuously running, wild, I think maybe even show on television. 25 years it ran. And uh, I was fortunate to be in the place where the big cats are, the Masai Mara National Reserve in Kenya, where we spend so much of our time. Think of it as our second home. And I was introduced. In fact, I helped them find the big cats, a film crew from Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And by that time, the host, a wonderful gentleman who I had actually acted as a guide for on one of his trips through East Africa, Marlon Perkins, was getting a little bit older. So they had, you know, younger, fit, big hunks like uh, Jim Fowler to, to as his sidekick. And so they said to me, they said, you know, after I've been taking them around a bit, and as you know, a bit of a chatterbox, they said, you know what? you might do okay in front of the camera. So next time they came to Nairobi, we went into the garden of a friend and they shot a little piece of me talking to the camera. Anyway, the word came back from Don Meyer of Mutual Loma, Wild Kingdom. And he said, yeah, he said, maybe, but he really isn't very sexy. <laughs> so then Warren, Warren and Jenny Gar said to me, hey, listen, you know, you, you were having a bad day. You're in Nairobi. You're out of your element. Let's shoot something of you with the big cats. Let's get you animated. And they did. And they signed me up. And the rest and is was, history because that led to, I don't even want to try listing the shows because I'm probably going to miss one, but uh, Big Cat Diary, which was BBC and Animal Planet, if I'm not mistaken. And then on Animal Planet and Discovery, Big Cat Tales. That's the latest. Uh, yeah, I mean. But before that, we did Flamingo Watch. We did live television with uh, uh, Discovery from the Masai Mara. Uh, really? Which was, yeah, 1989. And I can tell you, it was 
very tough because now you can look at us now. We can communicate. You're in wherever the United Southern States. Southern California. Okay. Yeah, you're in Southern California. I'm in Kenya. When we decided to do a live show from the Mara, we had to send the signal from the Mara to Longanot in the Rift Valley to a tracking station with huge dishes to then beam it out of the country because you weren't allowed to go direct. And when oh. we put yes, no, because of security, you know, in those right, days people right. were concerned, you know, what are you guys going to be doing? And the irony was when the first program went out, and you know, live television is such a buzz. And we were really on a high, the Lions were performing, we were performing, and then word comes back from Turner Broadcasting, who were also one of the co-producers, yeah, it's great guys, but it's all black and white, we can't get color. And it turned out that the guys at Longanot at the satellite tracking station, they didn't want the BBC to come and tell them how to do the links and all the rest of it, and the BBC said, fine, anyway, they hit a snag, and fortunately, we had Richard Leakey, the famous anthropologist, with us to interview him. And when we got the message, black and white pictures, it's breaking up, he said, don't worry, I'm going to make a phone call. He made a phone call. Suddenly, we're in business. And we said, who did you phone? He said, the president. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. So... What? Okay. <laughs> there is so much. I could talk to you for hours, Jonathan. While, let, let's start at the beginning here. Right. Wildlife photographers, clearly. TV yeah. show hosts, clearly. Yeah. You're also yeah. educators and authors. So yes. the way I, lo I look at it and kind of what I gathered from, you know, browsing your website and stuff is, is documenting lions and leopards and cheetahs in the Maasai Mara National Reserve in Kenya. And you've been doing that as we've kind of just summed up for over 40 years, right. that has led you to some, I'm going to call them collaborations or affiliations, but you're a SanDisk Extreme Team member, uh, which yeah. is awesome. But here's one of the things, because I always want to bring in, I do the same thing with Rick Salmon, because his wife, Susan, I, I won't say it to his face, but she may be a better photographer than Rick, right? Yes. Susan is an amazing photographer as well, as is, as is your wife. You're no. the only couple to have won the overall award in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition as individuals, which is, you know, amazingly rare. Yeah. But I do want to touch on, and, and this is going to lead us to an announcement that we've got here today, too. But I want to talk about your books because you've got over 34 books as far as writing and illustration is concerned. Mm -hmm. You've actually got a children's book. Yeah, lots. Okay, but I only knew about uh, Big Cat. No, no, no. We, we Antarctica. We, we met Rick, the wonderful Rick Salmon, explorer of light from the USA. We met him in Antarctica. In fact, I think we were stuck in the ice near Snow Hill Island photographing emperor penguins. So you so, did the Drake uh, Passage then? Yeah, yeah. And, and we did. You see, where we've been lucky is with the filming, it's reached out of Africa. So in, 90, in the late 1970s, or the late 1990s, Angie and I were brought on as traveling hosts to record segments for a thing called Wild Things. It was a bit of a sort of mutual of Omaha, you know, quite a lot of hype, you know, get out there, you know, show us some exciting things, which was Paramount Television. And it ran for three years, and then they syndicated it. And we went to Borneo, we went oh. to the Komodo Islands, we went to Australia, we went, and then later we went to Alaska, and later we did Big Cat Diary, the TV show, which ran from 1996 to 2008, which people still talk about, BBC Animal Planet Discovery. When that was such a huge success, of course, everybody said, what other diaries can we do? And we did a big bear diary. And I did the brown bears in Alaska. So we've done a book, a children's book on brown bears, on Antarctica, penguins, crocodiles, Which, loads and, of it. And those same type of topics are hit in, I don't want to call them adult books, but you know what I mean, right? The, the non-kids books, your normal books. You've got Big Cat Man, which is an autobiography, yeah. Sacred Nature, Life's Eternal Dance, which won the Gold Award for Photography, Independent Publishers Book Awards in 2017, and uh, Sacred Nature Volume 2, which is called yeah. Reconnecting People to Our Planet, is coming out this year, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And that kind of brings us to the Kickstarter. I want to I want to talk about the Kickstarter. 
Just, just one thing to pick up on, because I think it would be very interesting for the audience, particularly with photographers. You know, these are tough times for all of us. Yeah. And a lot of people are going to be thinking, is there a living to be made as a photographer? Well, the first thing I'd say is learn to be a stills photographer. In today's world, you've got to be able to shoot video as well. You need to understand sound. You need to be able to basically do it all. And when you were listing books, television work, you know, radio, whatever it is, safari guides, I thought to myself, you know, the key to our longevity, and I'm now in my 70s, the key to our longevity in terms of our career has been embracing everything that you can. And Rick Salmon is very good at this. You know, you keep looking for opportunity. Okay, so we're doing an adult's book, but is there a children's book we can do here too? Is there an ebook? We've just done an ebook for SanDisk, which will be available free. And so there's always, you know, looking for how can you be adaptable? How can you keep your fingers in a lot of pies? So I'm always saying to youngsters, you know, don't narrow yourself in because, you know, you may suddenly find like we did when the picture library business, you remember putting your images into picture agencies, Getty, you know, you could make your, you could earn your pension, passive income by all those images we put with stock libraries. And then suddenly all change, just overnight almost. The big guys, Getty, Corbis, Gates, took over the little guys and the, the price, that the worth of an image suddenly plummeted. It's like the price of oil, $100 a barrel to 10 bar barrels a dollar, you know, and so, you need to be adaptable. And so I'd always say to people, don't, don't get it, don't, don't sit in your comfort zone thinking, oh, this is pretty good. Yeah, this is, I'm doing well. No, what will you be doing in two or three years' time? What is your next project? Yeah. And and a good, you know, the way I always look at it is don't wait for opportunities. No. Make your opportunities, right? Make you it know, happen. Always, if you see something, you 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 go for it. And if and if what you want to do doesn't exist, create the opportunity. And in today's world, you have never had greater opportunities for the individual through social media to create your own portal. And, and they, you're, you're dead right, because the analogy for me would be, and again, we say it to people the old, in, in the old days, we'd be desperate waiting for the next commission for a television show or a book, waiting for, is the BBC going to call? Are they right. ringing? No. Now you've got no excuse. You create your own content. You create your own YouTube channel. You know, you stay busy and active doing what you're good at. That's the key thing. Stick with what you're really good at. Branch out. Don't be intimidated to try new things, but don't wait for the phone to ring. Well, and and even on books, you can publish your own book now if you really want to, which is really where Kickstarter comes in. Because exactly. Kickstarter is an ability for somebody to have an idea. Yeah. And, you know, a do your market testing and find out are people interested while at the same time funding the project to self-produce it. Yeah. Your new book that we mentioned the uh, uh, second ago, nature. Sacred Nature, Volume Two, is also kind of tied to something called the Sacred Nature Initiative and the yes. Kickstarter and everything. So the Kickstarter, this is going to air, I, I believe, February 11th. I don't have my calendar in front of me. And your Kickstarter launches on February 2nd, I think, correct? Yes, we saw okay. second. Yeah. So when this airs, it will already be live, and I'll have a link in the show notes for this. Tell people about what the Kickstarter is about and Sacred Nature Initiative. You know, it's exactly what you say. Suddenly, in the old days, you would be thinking to yourself, especially a big book, Sacred Nature 2, 288 pages, 186 color and black and white photographs. It is a sumptuous book printed on beautiful Japanese OG printing paper, you know, best publishers in the world. It, it's the book that you, it's solid. If it fell on you, you'd know all about it. But it's the kind of book, and this is so important, it's the kind of book any photographer would dream of being able to be published. And there's the trick. If you went to a conventional publisher, they're going to look at it and say, oh, the paper, that's too expensive. The size of the book, too big, too many pages, too many images. It's going to be too expensive. We've got to bring the price down. You would find it very hard to get the book of your dreams published with the pictures designed and laid out by your son, which is in our case. 
So we decided, you know what? We're going to actually press, you know, push the limits. We're going to design it ourselves. We're going to self-publish, but through a publisher. So have a publisher who will do all the marketing and sales and the distribution. But basically, we raise the money for the print and the, you know, for the actual publication. And so this is, I'm, I'm talking to Franz Lanting, another wonderful photographer, Art Wolf. It's all about raising Normally, you'd be talking about sponsors and, you know, big corporations, Art Wolf going to the wilderness or, you know, nature, the natural history units and uh, various conservation organizations to back his book. Franz, or the publisher you know, pays for everything and you get a small portion of it. I know. And also the publisher then controls everything, everything. the way it looks. And this way you, you, you take it into your own hands. But we've been very fortunate, I think, and this is where multitasking and having these different layers to our career, because of our television profile, you know, which means millions of people watch those shows, it means that you have a ready-made audience who enjoys your work and who, and if they like what you're doing, and as you say, you know, we... We don't only work with big cats and focus on big cats, but we help to conserve these amazing areas and amazing species. And so in doing that, there's a lot of goodwill out there. And so we feel that we can generally reach out to people and ask for their support. And Kickstarter creates a whole platform, a whole template which we're now busily putting in all the images and the pledges, you know, safari options to come on safari with us. You know, we reach out to hotels for free, you know, accommodation. So as the money goes to the campaign. And then in this instance, the books, both the one uh, 2016 Sacred Nature, Life's Eternal Dance and the new one, Sacred Nature 2, they're the flagships for what you mentioned, what we created and founded two years ago, the Sacred Nature Initiative, which is to take the ethos of the books, which is, oh my God, look at the wonder of this incredible planet. And then remind yourself the fragmentation and what we're doing to it, and then bring the idea that there is hope, and this is how you can make a difference. So the Sacred Nature Initiative is a global initiative built on three pillars inspire people with the images and the pictures, the television programs, the books, educate, get to the children, the children's books. You know, these little kids, it's their future. As Jane Goodall said, you know, we're actually destroying the future of our kids. We're not bequeathing it to them. Right. So then education, and then finally, you can conserve. If you've educated people, inspired them, and you now show them Big Cat Diary or Big Cat Tales, they'll say, oh my God, I want to visit. Oh my goodness, somebody says the lions are being, you know, are on the way out. What can we do to help? So that's the ethos. And it's all wrapped up in the Kickstarter campaign because you can purchase the book ahead of time, 20% off. You can also contribute to the Sacred Nature Initiative. And there's all, all kinds of goodies. Yeah. So, okay. To me, what you just described with those three pillars is what you want in community. Yeah. Because you've got the get their attention part by inspiring yeah. them. You've yeah. got the then give them the information that they need to, to have to make decisions, which is the education part. And yeah. then you take that into now let's all work together as a community to do the conservation part. And yeah. again, I, I, I'm going to keep coming back to your your varied levels of experience with the TV, with the writing, with with all of the stuff that you you do, the photography. I think that all of that uh, works to to draw people in, and and works as almost like a foundation yeah. for getting them on board to to work together as a community. Uh, all the links to the Kickstarter. And everything else with Jonathan and Angela will be on the website behind the shot.tv. So let's get into some questions here because I have a couple. There's 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 some interesting things. When we talk about the shot, we're gonna talk about in a second. Yeah. We when I was going back and forth and getting the the assets I needed to produce the show, one of the things was, and I don't want to share what it is yet because I want it to be a surprise for people, but there was a something that you did editing on this photo. Yes. Yeah. That is a wildlife photo. And yeah. you know. 
has those type of connotations to it, and that is the do's and don'ts of manipulating wildlife imagery. So your work to me, and actually you can see it when you go to your site, it spans from fine art to no. almost photojournalism. Yeah. So from a helicopter point of view, what are the general do's and don'ts for manipulating wildlife images? And obviously I'm going to guess sure. that a big part of that is the use model. So if you're using it for journalism, as opposed to designing something, somebody's going to hang on the wall behind them. But, but what, what's your thought on that? I, I think it's very straightforward. And, 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 you know, has there ever been a more pertinent moment in history in America and in the world of what happened to the truth? That is the key. It's the key word. I'm high-fiving you, you from America yeah, now because it's true. It, it's And this is the key to it. You see, it got awfully complicated. When digital, uh, you know, when uh, digital photography first hit the, the airwaves and people suddenly found that they can actually be more creative, in other words, they could change things more easily. I mean, people, Angie always has loved black and white. She she had a, a little black and white studio, a little dark room under the stairs her dad built for her at her home when she was a kid. Always loved, and she loved to dodge and burn and, and you know, create something out of what she took and then create it in terms of the vision that she had when she took it. And things got very messy when digital photography sort of became, fell into the hands of particularly advertising studios and people, you know, who wanted to create imagery from real life products, you know, in other words, a cheetah running, uh, right. you know, two lions fighting or whatever it was. So you've got the basic um, phot photograph that was taken and then manipulate it to fit a message, to create a, you know, a story. And some photographers saw the opportunity with digital photography and being very creative with the computer, with their Adobe Lightroom and, and all the, you know, the toys they could have to create what they wanted. And people started to customize let's say we're wildlife photographers, but it could be travel photographers, let's say wildlife. They began to customize the shots, which they knew were high selling images for the stock agencies, for the libraries, which outsource the images for books, magazines, but most importantly, the high selling images for the advertising industry. And some of those people manipulated the images and they didn't want to tell you that the tiger running towards you through snow, a Siberian tiger, which was going to be on a huge billboard advertising wilderness, you know, and last, you know, an endangered or species. cigarettes, yeah. Yeah, whatever it might be, that actually it was a rather fat tiger, you know, Siberian tiger, yes, but on a ranch, maybe somewhere in North America, in the snowy season with a trainer and a photographer maybe behind some kind of protection or maybe just lying in the snow and clicking away and taking the picture. And the photographer wouldn't necessarily want to jeopardize the sale in case the person buying it said, oh God, it was, it was shot in captivity, but we're putting it on, on, you know, the world of mammals and it's going to be on the front, you know, cover of a David Attenborough book. Oh, we better not do that. Or we'll have to have a symbol saying it's, it's actually been digitally manipulated. And this gets back to the truth. As long as people are upfront with whatever it's do, whatever they're doing, whatever they create in terms of their imagery, as long as the audience who are going to receive it are aware of the fact, don't believe what you see, this has been, you know, this isn't real. It's like a, a you know, right a record cover or something to sell, you know, baked beans or, or, or SO, you know, petrol. They don't believe, but of course, and this is where Nat Geo made the big distinction. They want to see the raw files because they have been caught short once in a while with stories. I'll give you an example, Tanzania. They had a photographer on assignment and uh, he, he sort of went out with a group of um, uh, local Tanzanians who were still hunter gatherers. And in one picture, they're carrying tusks because they did used to hunt and maybe still do occasionally elephants. And then, you know, they'd eat the meat and then they would, you know, keep the ivory, whatever it was. Anyway, somebody noticed the tusks being carried over one of the Tanzanians' shoulders. When they looked at the base of the tusks, they saw 
there was numbers written on it. And so this photographer had basically set up the shot with these guys, the real deal guys, but didn't have and didn't want to kill an elephant to show what kind of business they sometimes were into and sort of, you know, managed to get some tusks out of, you know, the, the pound where they were kept regulated and set up the shot. And of course, National Geographic were furious when it later came out and somebody noticed it and somebody said, hey, in a minute, National Geographic trades in the truth. Right. We believe in you. Now, there would have been no problem at all if the photographer had said, look, I can get this shot, but it's set up. Nat Geo wouldn't have used it. But in, say, another you know, editorial piece where they said, we have reconstructed the situation and used right. There's no there, issue. You, you have to give that publisher the chance to do the disclaimer. Right. Yes. They they have That's, to be able to do that. When I had a conversation yeah. with Moose Peterson and yeah. I, I was talking to him about some of his shots. And one of the things he said to me is, I'm not here to make art. I'm here to I mean, I'm paraphrasing. This isn't a quote exactly. Yeah. But effectively, what he said was, I'm here to document. And yeah. and that really is the key. But that comes to, to another question, yeah. regardless of species, because you've been all around the world. And I'm guessing there is a difference in penguins and, and lions. Yeah. Aside from size and, you know, ferociousness. Yeah. Uh, is there, if you were to give people one key to getting a better wildlife image, like, like somebody's going on a safari or going to Antarctica or going to Yosemite for their first mm. time to photograph wildlife, what's their, what's the one tip that would get somebody just that much closer to getting better wildlife shots? Okay, you know, and, and it's the thing that we're talking about a lot here because of the COVID epidemic and, and, and people having to think about traveling differently. One of the reasons we've been successful as wildlife photographers is that we put in quality time. And it doesn't matter whether it's wildlife or people, you need to get to know your subject. You need to do your research. There's no excuse anymore. Before you come out, go online, See, if you want to go and photograph tigers in Ranthambore in India, go online and find out, are there mothers with cubs, which are visible? Which camps are there? What kind of vehicles are there? You need to do your background. But the key is, if you're going to come on safari, don't think that you're going to have the best trip by choosing five different locations and barely stopping from unpacking your bag before you're on to the next location and think you had the most wonderful safari. No. Pick, because you can't do everything. You've got to be realistic. We haven't got we haven't got all the time in the world. But if you want to come and photograph the migration, or you want to come and photograph leopards, choose your spot, be in the right place at the right time, and let you settle in. You know, a week. Give yourself a week. If you can get a month, wonderful. Three days, great. Two days, no. You're barely unpacked. You need to spend time acclimatizing because until you start to think like your subject, this is what Angie does. She will sit with the Marsh Pride, the lions we've watched since the 1970s, and she will just immerse herself in the pride. She will just watch. And then every so often, she'll pick up her camera and she'll take a picture. None of this. Drr, drr. You know, of course, when you first arrive, you want to take everything. Yes, go ahead and do it. Just bring plenty of cards. That's all I would say. Right. But the fact is, give yourself time. It's quality over quantity because you will, yes, you could arrive on the first day, go out and watch the Marsh Pride. They get up and they kill a buffalo. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. Yes. But that is just chance. That's just being in the right place at the right time. But basically, you will do better the longer you spend the more concentrated and quiet and getting into the zone, make sure you've got the best guide and make sure you check your vehicle out before you come that it's photography friendly. Okay. So, wow. See, and, and one day I'm coming there. I'm just telling you right now, one day I'm coming there. So let's get into the photo. And before I bring it up, just to remind everybody, if you want to see today's photo, because some of the audience listens to an audio only version, some will watch the video. Uh, just to remind you, BehindTheShot.tv, I've got all the links, and I have today's photo in a small gallery of Jonathan and Angela's work. So make sure that you head there. You can check all of that out. The podcast itself is available in multiple forms. You can subscribe, and all the links are on the website too, by the way, for subscribing. 
but you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts in either audio only or in video format, assuming that your podcast app supports video and the video is up on YouTube. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, please make sure to go down, click the subscribe button. And it's a weird thing with the algorithm on YouTube. You can subscribe and not know when we do something. Don't know what that means, but if you hit subscribe, make sure you also hit the bell. Choose all. That way you'll know when I go live with the critique shows I do with Don Komarechka or when we release a new show or something like that. But again, you can get it wherever you get uh, uh, podcasts as well. So that brings us into today's shot. And this shot is called Scarface, the Real Lion King. And let me start here, Jonathan. When I first saw this image, so for people who don't know, I go back and forth with my guest to try and pick an image. And I want an image I have questions on, but I also want an image my guest is comfortable talking about and, and one that's conducive to the show. You can have a great image that doesn't work great in this type of a format. And so they usually send me, you know, four or five shots or something like that. And Jonathan sent me, you know, four or five shots or something like that. And immediately I went, that one. Because <laughs> this particular shot, this is majestic. If you're going to show a lion, if the lion could speak, the lion would go, that's the headshot I want on my social media profile, right? So let's start here. I'm going to try and describe this image for people that are on the audio only feed, because a lot of people, again, they, they do listen purely on the audio format. And if you want to see the picture, go to the website. It's, it's behindtheshot.tv. And... I don't think I'm going to do this shot justice, but Jonathan, you can let me know at the end if I, I absolutely butcher the description of your shot. And this, I'm going to start here. This lion is absolutely huge. It's, you know, Scarface, the real Lion King. And you, you ran off camera and grabbed something. What did you grab? So that is a children's book, Scarface, yeah. the real Lion King. Exactly. Yeah. And this is, so that's the same lion that's in the shot. Um, yeah, that, that's him. You see, look. I love it. Okay, so children's a, book yeah. with this lion. But here's what's interesting. When you compare that shot to this shot right here, this lion is huge. It's a portrait orientation shot. It's black and white. The lion is staring right down the lens. And here's the thing that jumped out at me with this shot. There is detail in every single inch of this image. You feel like this lion is looking right at you, right down the barrel of the lens. It's actually a little bit camera left, but like the lion could come at you and lick you or eat you, one <laughs> of the two. It's a bad yeah. hair day for the lion. Uh, that's yeah. a key part. So the hair is just everywhere. The body is wonderful. It's not straight behind the head. The body goes off camera left. Uh, the background is textured with bokeh, but it's also textured with this these shades of gray and grain, and the grain really makes this shot. And again, yeah. I'm going to go back to the same thing. This is the definition of a majestic lion to me, right? So the is Angie's photograph. I mean, I, I think in some ways, you know, it's it's a very interesting thing, man, woman, in terms of behind the camera. I tell you, it, like. Richard Leakey's dad, Louis Leakey, said when he wanted Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, Baruti Galdikas, the three, you know, ape ladies that he used to study, he set up to study gorillas, chimps, and orangutans, he said women see things differently, and they look at things differently. And Angie always says to me, she said, you make me laugh. You know, you see a lion like Scarface, and you say, oh, my God, look at this male. He's so magnificent, you know, because men respond to that sort of, you know, the warrior. Right. But Angie also, the way she photographs lions at times, she captures their essence. Sometimes, I don't know how she does it. You know, she's got the same cameras and sometimes she's in the same position. I often drive the vehicle, you know, because I understand the animals, she does too, but then it's much easier. You know, only one absolutely spot on position, get us into position, click. And this was you know, that hair, I love. And in fact, in Sacred Nature 2, the new book, there is a picture which was taken at the same time of Scarface with both eyes. And because we're going to get to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. So 
that that by the way is is the secret thing I said I did what weren't going to get to until later because it's it's an interesting thing what they did to this shot. Let's let's do technical first. Yeah. This was shot according to the EXIF data with an 800 an EF800 IS at 56 uh TV mode. So I I'm curious when you're shooting on this type of a a shoot, you're far yeah. away, do you normally yes. shoot both of you in uh, a time priority or an aperture priority as you opposed know, to fully manual? Sometimes we shoot fully manual, um, but there is definitely in terms of, you know, we basically our priority, our first priority is the shutter speed, you know, because with things moving around, yes, if you want a blurry effect and a creative you know, panning, movement shot, 30th of a second, fifth of a second, great. But in general, your first thought is, you know, here's this incredible animal and you want the detail. Which is here. Yeah, and and so, you know, cameras locked off. We have our cameras on video tripods on rails, which we have the, we have the doors off of our vehicle. So we have a rail, a metal rail, which allows us to slide a Manfrotto video head, which we can then put our lenses, our big guns on, 500, 600, 800, and swing the lens so we've got no door, no window, and we can get a 180 degree swing. So we've got, you know, exactly how we want things. Interesting. Yeah, and so 800 mil lens. Now, sometimes you're not that far from the animals. You don't wanna be so close, you're disturbing them. So it's great to be able to shoot with a big lens. But Angie loves the big lens because of that shallow depth of field. And just, you know what it is, there's, there's a huge difference. If you shoot a subject with a 300 mil lens to get the same framing as you would with an 800 mil lens, it's gonna look different. You know, right, that yeah. big lens for the portrait is perfect. And well, on this particular day, yeah. I was just going to say, because you get that comp lens compression. Exactly. Exactly. So sometimes, you you, you know, you're, you're trying to get that. And I tell you, that Canon 5.6, we've been waiting forever to, for Canon to bring out a faster version. But as you probably know, uh, they've recently, with their RF lenses, you know, with the, the whole digital thing and the mirrorless thing, they're now, I know Rick was using, you know, an 800 F11 you know, and a first thought for people like us would be, oh, my God, F11, you know, that's so stopped down. And, and you know, no, we, want, we wanted a big aperture in the old days. So when we were talking about this 800 5.6, we were hoping maybe they'd bring out an 800 F4 to give us more light. But, of course, it's all changed now because with ISO capabilities going through the roof, you don't need to spend an extra thousand bucks to get an extra F-stop in your aperture, you know, in terms of the dynamics of your lens. So Rick showed me some shots he shot with the 800 or the 500 F11, F8, just pin sharp. So anyway, but that that's well, a great lens. So this this shot, you said you focus on on shutter speed, which makes sense because this guy could take off two in a second. The, so you want to be sure of that. Yeah, the EXIF data for this says 320th of a second, ISO 1600, at, at 6.3 with auto white balance. And I'm assuming yeah. you shoot raw, so yes. white balance can yeah. be changed later. Here's what I, I'm fascinated about. The 320th of a second at 1600 ISO. In my head, and of course I'm not there, I don't know what kind of light it is. Yeah. That doesn't seem like enough in my head. What What is your process for choosing the shutter speed? I'm like, I guess a better way to word it is, when you're looking at that shutter speed and you're in in aperture, I'm sorry, time value mode, TV mode, shutter priority, uh, wh what are you going for? I mean, you don't need a thousandth of a second, 320th is usually enough? Yeah, I know what you're saying. I mean, in the old days, we used to have the benchmark. We used to have the rule of thumb, which was, and this was before image stabilization. I mean, oh my goodness, what a godsend, image stabilization. I can handhold some of these big guns, even the 800, and shoot it at 60th of a second. I wouldn't want to hold on to it too long, and I got to do press ups to keep my arms strong. But with image stabilization, that the, the rule of thumb I was going to mention was you used to say, if it's an 800 mil lens, which this was, to be sure there was no camera shake, you would want a minimum of the reciprocal of one over 800. So 800 mil lens, 500 mil lens, 500 mil lens, easier in terms of the numbers. 
500 mil length, minimum one five hundredth of a second to be sure that you won't introduce right. some blur that you don't want. One over one but, over focal length, basically. Exactly. But now there was two things here. One, the lion was looking at something, so he was pretty alert. There was a female around, and there was also another male from his coalition. So he was keeping an eye on the girl he's got near to him, the female, and another male. Is he going to come over? So he's got his eyes open, looking around. And so... Two things, Angie could shoot at that relatively slow speed for a big lens because she had it locked off right. on a video head, perfectly solidly stable. And then also you could see the ISO, she, she could shoot even at that speed. She could have been in the old days, I'd have been down to a 60th of a second because I wouldn't have wanted to shoot at a high ISO. I wouldn't want the graininess that came. But in this instance, perfect. Yeah. And so again, I'm going to go back to the composition on this because I tend to think, and I think a lot of photographers are this way. I think we all have those, those compositional things that fit our brain, right? Mm -hmm. I tend to think in landscape and I, I, I have to say, I would have, in my opinion, mess this up. This needs to be a portrait shot. It's, I love that it's portrait orientation. I could see this picture. When I say it's a portrait, a better way to think of it for those on the audio feed, this is a headshot. I could see this. If this cat had a website, this would be the picture on the cat's about page, basically. Most of your images though are in landscape orientation. Sure. For you as a wildlife photographer, and if you speak for Angie as well, do you do you tend to shoot any scene in both, or is there a deciding factor in your brain of this needs to be a portrait, this needs to be landscape? You know, I think at this point in our career, we're so visually stimulated, you know, we're so strong in terms of the way we visualize the images we want to get and recognize images which are waiting to be taken. And Scarface and the look of the shape of his head, the mane, you know, it basically just cried out for it. You just knew instinctively, you know, and when we're, when we're instructing people, when people come on safari with us, you know, you often just say, you'll see somebody, you know, in taking with the sort of horrors and you'll say, no, 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 it's a vertical, it's an upright. Just look at the shape, you know, like a giraffe leaning its neck down. You're not gonna take it horizontally. Secondly, and this is a thing that you also learn very quickly. When you first start taking pictures, you think, Oh, I've got to have the whole animal in the picture. No. When you look at an animal like Scarface, there is only one shot. It's all about his head. You don't want to see his backside, you know, or his tail or his body, because the more you take away from where the shot is, the weaker it becomes. Because, again, this is something that I often find, whether it's landscapes or whatever, is you can generally do with just tightening up the image. Maybe you're taking a picture of a sh- of a tree. First intention, got to have all of the crown and all of the branches. Then if you start to mess with it, take the top off it, and then you start to see, gosh, the power of the limbs coming up into the crown. I don't need the top of it. And when you look at the slightly tighter version, you realize, you know what? That's the shot. Yeah, which makes sense. And this shot, oh, oh you know what? I just thought of something. Yeah. I, I put the shot on screen alone. Yeah. And I'm realizing, and again, this is partially because it's a black and white image, yeah. but this is, again, the definition, this is zero to 255 on a grayscale, right? I mean, everything's in here. There's black, there's white, yeah. there's everything yeah. in between. But are there times that you go out to the Masai Mara and I mean, I'm assuming you either go at dusk or sunrise. I mean, what happens in a case like this where you've got this beautiful creature, you want to capture this beautiful creature, but it's noon, right? And it's harsh sunlight. And how how do you, I mean, do you ever look at midday light and go, oh man, if this was only eight o'clock in the morning? You know, it's so funny you say that because I read something the other day when we were doing our ebook, Sacred Nature, A Photographer's View. I had just read, I can't remember which photographer it was, but it's basically said, there is no such thing as bad light. There's light. 
And, and, and yes, I know what you mean. We can talk about the golden hour, the 10 minutes before, just after the sun comes up when you want to be backlit and sidelit. And it's just, oh, my God, you want it to be like that all day, but it isn't. The sun rises very quickly. We're out before sunrise until after dark, and we okay. stay out. There's no coming back to camp. We've got everything we need in the vehicle. And yes, you. the thing, what we do a lot of, and I always say to people, this is when you step up to becoming a photographer. It's when you start not just relaxing as somebody drives you to the next picture opportunity, it's keeping your eyes open and visualizing. You drive past a tree in the morning, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, imagine this tree when the sun's falling from that direction, and I know that there's a bunch of lions which are gonna come probably later and lie in the shade of that, or maybe it's a leopard and it's gonna go up the tree. We're creating pictures from the opportunities, the physical landscape we see, and we're adding and subtracting. We're seeing them. So as when actually the moment happens, you come back, oh my goodness, there it is. You're not all fingers and thumbs, oh God, I turned the camera off, where's my camera? Oh, I put it away, I thought the light was no good, we won't take pictures again to the sub. No. You've got it's, to be ready and you've got to be creating. It's pre-visualization is really what it is. So here's the thing though, and let's get into the, the special part here. This shot comes into post yeah. and are you a Lightroom user? And do you know, I've got to admit, I am technically a dinosaur. So <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, my wife is creative but she loved the darkroom and now the computer and Adobe and all those different, she's got plugins and stuff and this kind of thing, but she keeps it pretty simple. Well, she keeps it pretty simple. I guess the big question, there's two big questions. Number one, yeah. what made, you know, either you or her choose black and white, which I got to say to me, the fact that the quote unquote color has been removed from this makes yeah. it more majestic and more 3d, I think than the color would have been. But yeah. then what what did you do to this image that we started with earlier today with, you know, the do's and don'ts? Yeah. So Angie loves black and white. I think to her and, and, you know, to be honest, and it's a very interesting thing because we did something which most people avoid. Sacred Nature One, Life's Eternal Dance. We mixed color with black and white. Now, generally, people who are uh, into black and white and who publish books with black and white images, they would say, oh, you can't mix color up with black and white. It's gonna jar, you turn, the, you know, you take away from the emphasis and I can see what they mean. But Son David, our creative director, he did the most extraordinary job where I love to see the mix of color and black and white, but it was interesting because Angie loves black and white, absolutely loves it. When we were putting together Sacred Nature 2, she was worried there's not enough black and white. There's 186 pictures, 60 of them are black and white. And for a while, she was sort of said, you know, are there really enough? But we said to ourselves, look, we are going to stick to images which you just, they've got to earn their place. You're not going to put them in there. You're not going to try and, oh, well, let's add, because that's the old style. When you do a book for a publisher and they say to you, because it's it's maybe text driven, they say, oh, we need a picture to illustrate the text. No. With this book, we wrote a text to tell the story about the imagery and what we were trying, you know, the landscapes we wanted to follow. So black and white, Angie's absolutely favorite. And quite frankly, the starkness, the moodiness of black and white, the way black and white concentrates the modeling. I don't, can you really talk about modeling in a black, in, in a color photo? It seems to me, I, it doesn't seem to fit. I like to think that sense of really bringing out the architecture. Now that's Ooh, a good, good word. word. My, dad was, man, my dad was an architect. The architecture of scars, Scarface's face, the 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 sort of the it's a sculpture. It's you know, and sculpture again, black and white. And so, to me, you want to really get into the essence of this lion's character. Don't get any of you know. Oh, he's got a big black mane. I don't want to see that. Black, black and copper and gingery, and you know, and the color of his eyes and the pink of his tongue and the whiteness of his teeth. Just give it to me. 
I want no, to it's, rent- it's the no- it's the nooks and crannies. Yeah. Really, and here to- this this is the detail that yes. color would lose. And 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 what it does, and I think this is what Angie brings to it and, and loves about it is, and this is what great artists do. They render the subject down to its essence. This is Scarface. I look at that picture. I could never get tired of that picture. And I can't no. say that about a lot of pictures. I no, could but never this get is, tired. again, the, the best way to describe it is if Scarface could talk, Scarface would go, if Scarface were looking on a light table at old negatives and choosing the shot to represent them, this is the shot Scarface would pick. It's just and, amazing. And, and I'll give you, I'll give you a little analogy as to why it's so, you know, the power of this image. We had a group uh, from, from the United States um, and they sold health products. Lovely group of people. I'd met them and Angie had met them. They did an incentive trip for their top salespeople. And the head of the company, the founder of the company uh, was along with them, a big man, very powerful, real presence. When he talked to the group, everybody listened. And at the end of the trip, the people said to us, the participants, they said, we want to give Frank something really significant that reminds him of the trip and of you guys and the Mar and everything. And I said, there's only one picture. It's Scarface. And I said, you know why? Because this guy is a warrior. This guy is a leader. This guy, you look into his face and you know he is not going to take one backward step. He's a lion. And he will actually die, and this isn't quite true in terms of lions will sometimes run, but in general, when the stakes are down, there's no, even with a little lion, you don't turn and run. It's like with a bear, don't run from another bear. You've got to stand and face up and keep looking. And if you want to back off, back up, but don't turn your back. This lion is the boss. So let's talk about the eye. Right. Uh, Just, we'll touch on this real quick. Yeah. What did you do to the eyes that was that that thing that we were okay. talking about earlier? This, this picture, you know, touches on a lot of things that we believe in and don't believe in, or that we believe in, but also that we we query at times. We took this image to a great friend of ours, Nigel Pavett, uh, a lovely man, great photographer, who is a, a what we'd call in Swahili a fundi in terms of his photographic techniques, his printing. He's a, he's a great printer. He's got his own printing press. You know, when I say printing press, he's got his own big printer in his house. And uh, he's done some printing for us. And he does a wonderful job. And we we really absolutely trust him. We took this picture of Scarface, the original picture of Scarface. And of course, Scarface is called Scarface because he's only got one eye. So where's the picture? You know, as you can see, his right eye. It was damaged. When we first saw him as a four-year-old, he had the most horrendous wound. He could probably still see out of the eye at that point, but in time, he couldn't. He was blind. and But it's always bloody because like the boxer, he can no longer see the punches coming from that side. So it looks as if it just happened. And he is, do you know what? This lion is 13 years old. Multiply that by seven, cat's lives to human lives. Well, he's 91 sort of thing, wow. you know, in that, sort of, that idea. And he's still there. His back leg is messed, whatever it is. But anyway, back to him. We take the picture to Nigel. And this, and, and this is no, no reason to sort of feel yes or no, did we like the idea or not? He said, you know what? Why don't we give Scarface his eye back? Let's have a look at what Scarface would have looked like with both eyes. And so he took his one good eye, his left eye, and he put it in his right eye. And when he did it, we just looked at this, and I mean, look, Scarface, millions of people, people come to the Mara saying, I need to see this lion. You know, he's an icon. But the fact is, and we, as you'll see in Sacred Nature 2, the new book, there is a picture of him as he is with his bad eye, and he looks magnificent. But this picture is a picture, it's a tribute in a sense, because when Nigel said, well, you know, let's try this. And we looked at him, we said, you know what? That's, that's just amazing. This is what he would have looked like, you know, because there's a lot of lions look beaten up, but they don't all lose, lose an eye. And so we then thought, you know what? We're going to print because we just love the image so much and we love this lion. And we thought 
we're going to pay a tribute to Scarface, the real Lion King, but we're going to tell people that actually it's been manipulated. And then it's people's choice. You see, this is the point. You give them a choice. They can say, oh, I don't think you should have done that. Why not? It was for right. it was it came out of somebody saying that's you know the wonders of what you can do in terms of changing things. In general, it's something that we just we're not interested in playing around with reality. We love nature as it is. So most of our images, and you'll look at them, they because I think in today's world a lot of images, particularly landscape, they're, they're sort of more like travel brochure images. Right. They're, they're too yeah. they're, like, as I say back like away record- from the vibrant slider. <laughs> It's sort of like advertising, you know, yeah. hey, I, I love nature. Anyway, so back to Scarface. So we've created this image and hey, it's, it's just incredible. And for those those people who, who like him and love him and whatever it is, this is our guy. Well, two things. One, thank you for sharing the image and please thank Angie for me as well because well, it is an amazing image. Before we leave, I, I do want to touch on the Kickstarter again in a second. But before we leave, I have a question for you that I surprise everybody with. I don't tell you in advance because I, I, I kind of want to see the thought process behind it. Who is a photographer that people should know about? They may know about, they may not know about, but a photographer you think people should go look up. Oh, e- easy. And I know Angie would say the same thing. There is a wonderful French photographer called Vincent Mounier. Vincent Mounier, M-U-N-I-E-R. He's the most gentle, quiet, unassuming man you could ever meet. And this guy lives and breathes. Photography is his passion. Photography is his world. And he comes from a region where his dad, and we went to, we we were co-sort of hosting, you know, uh, resources in the Netherlands at a wildlife photography symposium. And and he was speaking there. What a privilege. We knew him from before. He won endlessly the Young Wildlife Photographer of the Year, like four years running, or the Eric Hoskins, you know, Young Photographer. Then he won the whole thing. And I mean, it just proved that, you know, if you're really, really that good, you will win that competition. You know, I still feel there's an element of luck that I won it. Angie certainly deserved to win it. But for Vincent, it would have been a tragedy if a guy like that entered it. Vincent Munier, his dad used to take him out into the wilds of snowy. He loves the whiteness, black and white. He loves foxes. He loves musk ox. He loves, and he mixes still photography with his videography. And during this symposium, it was breathtaking. He went to film and photograph the white wolves probably the same white wolves that Jim Brandenburg did such an amazing job with some years back, Mount Ellesmere. Anyway, he goes out there and he's camping and he's trekking. You know, he's this guy's hardcore. He suffers for his profession and he loves being there, being part of the whole experience. And on, on let, let's, and it may not be quite true, but let's say on the 10th day, when he's almost out of time, he's still there, he's waiting. He opens the flap of his tent and there in the distance, Running towards him is this pack of white wolves, and he starts to cry. The camera is shaking. He's recording it. He's with another guy who's also with, and they're recording it. And these wolves come up, and they sniff around the tent, and he got some mind-boggling images. But, oh, this guy, you know, and, and I think this is so important. We talked, we were talking, you and I, about Angie's great truism. You know, life's, life should be a competition of generosity. This is a wonderful guy, and he loves to share his work. He's got an ego that you don't even see. He could walk through the smallest door, so unassuming. He just lets his pictures speak for him. And this is what Angie does. I talk the hind leg off a donkey. Angie just sits in the zone, presses the shutter, and then you don't need to say anything. You just look. What you said when we were before we were recording in the green room, you mentioned that phrase, and that is a good relationship is a competition of generosity, which oh. I wrote down because I love that phrase so much. Uh, Jonathan Scott and your wife Angela 
I can't say thank you again enough. The Kickstarter runs from February 2nd through the end of February, is it? That's right. Okay. The link to the Kickstarter, when we're recording this, it hasn't launched yet because we're recording in January, but when this airs, Kickstarter is live at the time that you're watching this. So there will be a link to the Kickstarter. <clears throat> Excuse me. There will be a link to the Kickstarter in the show notes at behindtheshot.tv. Make sure you go there. All the links to, to Jonathan and Angela's work and their social media profiles, et cetera. Uh, it's the bigcatpeople.com, or not the, but just bigcatpeople.com is the website. And all the links to their social media, YouTube, et cetera, are all there. And again, February 2nd is the Kickstarter. And I can't say it enough. The, the Sacred Nature Initiative and Sacred Nature Volume 2, uh, just two amazing projects. I, I, I really appreciate your sharing all this. It's incredible. I've loved every minute of talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to everybody, just to remind you, Jonathan Scott, Angela Scott, let me just say them to you verbally really quick on Facebook. It's Jonathan Angela Scott, Instagram, the big cat people, YouTube, the big cat people. And again, the website is bigcatpeople.com. Check out the Kickstarter and you can get the link for the Kickstarter over at the website behind the shot.tv. As far as I am concerned, uh, you can find me on social media as well. I'm in all the normal places, right? You can find me at, at Steve Brazel on Instagram or YouTube, Behind the Shot TV, Instagram, or uh, I'm sorry, Instagram or Twitter, Behind the Shot TV, Instagram or Twitter. It's Behind the Shot on YouTube, Behind the Shot on Flickr. And of course, the website is BehindTheShot.tv. For me, it's SteveBrazel.com. The new live remote learning class, that's actually going to be at... Um, Princeton Photo Workshop. It's in April. It's three consecutive weeks for Princeton Photo Workshops. And uh, it's an hour and a half each week, one night per week, three consecutive weeks in April. The challenges of low light action photography. We're going to have a lot of fun. It is a live interactive class. So I hope that you join me for that. To everybody, thanks as always for stopping by, by Behind the Shot. To my guest, Jonathan Scott, Angela Scott, behind him in the photo the whole time. So to Angela, thank you as well. And I hope that we will uh, see you on the next show. Thank you.